presentation will come up in a moment. We're just going to do a five minute kind of primer on blockchain just to get everybody on the same page. We've done this uh, presentation at uh, Stanford and Google and it's gotten some, a pretty good uh, response. So what we do is we call blockchain, uh, the four, there's four pillars of disruption. And so I'm going to go through these four pillars. But before I get into the four pillars, what I'd like to say is that blockchain is a distributed ledger technology. What that means is it's a new kind of database which is not centralized, where you store data um, in a distributed fashion or a decentralized fashion rather than in a centralized way. Ah, here we go. So, next slide please, there's only one slide. So what I'd like to do is talk about um, the blockchain as a specific kind of DLT or distributed ledger technology. And so a blockchain, like what it sounds like, is a chain of blocks. So there's a uh, set of data that is in each block, and each block contains information about the previous block, which chains all of the blocks together. So with this approach, and something called a consensus protocol, you can get what is called an ultra-secure and immutable store of information. A lot of people feel that if you have a uh, blockchain, you therefore have something that is immutable, and you have something that is ultra-secure. This actually is not the case. It really comes down to the consensus protocol, and there is a um, trade-off, as you heard in the previous speaker, between the level of security and typically the speed or efficiency of the specific blockchain. So today, many of the blockchains use proof of work. Proof of work is ultra secure and does typically lead to an immutable store of information, but it's also very slow. And therefore, what that means is, is that it's typically not scalable. So, there are a whole range of different kinds of blockchains. There are permission blockchains, there are permissionless blockchains, and there are many different kinds of consensus protocols, some of which are actually very fast. But there again is a trade-off between the speed and the security. So that's really the first pillar. You can build this ultra-secure uh, and immutable uh, database, which in the age of Facebook and many of these centralized databases that we have is something very, very special and is actually a significant paradigm shift. Pillar two, and you've heard about this in Sam's presentation as well as in the Simply Vital Health presentation, is that there is a decentralization of transactions. So if you have this uh, DLT, it's a distributed ledger, um, you're typically going to be doing processing in a decentralized way. The um, smart contract, which you've heard many of the speakers, or two of the speakers talk about, enables you to build a trustless contract. That means there's no intermediary. And because you have no intermediary, you can actually decentralize the processing of all of the activity within an application. So um, these decentralized transactions, the more, most popular, as we heard, the ERC-20 protocol uh, from Ethereum is really a specification for a smart contract. But it is not the only protocol for smart contracts. There's actually a lot of different ones out there. And if you go to permission chain systems, maybe you're using something like Forum, or if you're going to be doing something on like IBM Hyperledger, they're going to be using a different underlying blockchain. But in all of these, typically you have a smart contract. And when you have a smart contract, because it's trustless without an intermediary, it's going to lead to decentralized transactions. These decentralized transactions typically take place on nodes. And so you've obviously most likely heard about miners. Miners are people that run nodes. But you also have uh, computers known as nodes that run transactions, sometimes they're known as super nodes, sometimes they're known as master nodes. But these are carrying out 
decentralized transactions, typically running smart contracts. So that's really the second pillar. Um, and again, very different from the centralized infrastructure that we have today. The third is built-in gamification. Many of you have probably heard of cryptocurrencies or tokens. These tokens go hand in hand with these smart contracts because they enable the smart contracts to work. You can think of these smart contracts as being point operated. And so these point operated smart contracts use this cryptocurrency, but the cryptocurrency can be used as a reward. So this is typically um, what you hear with regards to Bitcoin, there's a reward for the miners. Um, but it can also be used to incentivize or pay uh, for certain types of activities. And Sam was talking about uh, you know, using neurons as a payment uh, in a competition. So this is again like a reward. It can also be like in a video game where you have um, you know, incentives um, or you're trying to um, lead to a certain, you're trying to get people to uh, carry out a particular behavior that obviously leads to things like behavior modification, um, which is very good for healthcare. So um, the fourth pillar you heard uh, Sam also talking about GitHub. All of these projects tend to be open source. Anything built on the Ethereum blockchain is open source uh, because it's uh, GPL and LGPL as the underlying code base. So anything built on it is also open source. Um, and so you can go and you can become part of these projects if you've heard of all the different kinds of Ethereum um, that exist today, there's two main types of people that are constantly forking it. There's uh, another one called Forum, which is built on it. Um, it sounds like simply vital, it's going to do the same thing. So the software is actually owned by the community, not by a company. So that's another difference. So if you look at these four things, you've got a decentralized or distributed database, you have decentralization of transactions, so these transactions are taking place at a lot of different nodes, again, not centralized and not by a single entity. You have built in gamification and you have open source. This is incredibly different from the world that we live in today and is very disruptive because it provides us with capability that we really very much need, especially in healthcare. So with that, I hope that puts everybody on the same page. We're going to kick off. Thank you. Thank you, Jordan. Uh, my name is Reese Jones, and uh, we have uh, a good-sized panel here tonight, and we're going to cover different points of view about uh, uh, applications of blockchain in healthcare. And uh, in addition to what Jordan was saying, the, the three basic things that blockchain uh, brings to internet protocols that weren't built into the original internet protocols is uh, the identity and trust and money. And that those things ideally would have been built into TCP, IP, and web protocols, but they weren't. And so in a simple way to think about blockchain is another improved uh, addition to the internet protocols that will enable new categories of things, including in healthcare, and tonight we're going to talk about that. So maybe you want to start with uh, each person introducing themselves and uh, very briefly, and, and so we can get things going. Sure, I'm, I'm Paul Willard. I'm a partner at Storm Ventures, uh, enterprise software, early stage enterprise software fund. I think I've invested in four blockchain companies at this point. My name is Lisa Mackey. I'm the co-founder of Pocket Doc, which also is the founder of DocChain, which is a blockchain implementation, implementation in healthcare. We're built on the Sawtooth uh, architecture, Intel Sawtooth architecture, which uses proof of elapsed time as its uh, as its model its protocol. And I've been in software for quite a while, and now I'm an EIR at Storm Ventures. Hi, I'm Wendy Baker Men Evans. I'm a managing partner at Deliver Group. Um, we do a lot in the way of strategy and the implementation of blockchain technology. Um, I'm very heavily focused in healthcare. Um, and then incidentally, my partner and I are raising a fund that is going to be focused um, partially on crypto and partially on enterprise blockchain. 
Sandy Bauer, co-founder of the AI Institute. Uh, so Jordan Woods, I'm also with Double Double Group. I uh, work with uh, Radhika. Uh, we have a lot of experience uh, in ICO advisory. Uh, read probably around 250 white papers, and uh, we've been in the space for quite a while. Um, and uh, we have helped a number of companies in the healthcare space specifically to uh, go through the pre-sale process, and like I just mentioned, uh, currently raising a fund called Start Chain Bank. So uh, an important thing for people new to blockchain is there isn't one blockchain. There's many different blockchains. So Bitcoin has a blockchain, uh, Ethereum has a blockchain, and there's others in addition that have, each have different characteristics and strengths and weaknesses. Um, the most famous is Bitcoin's blockchain, but the, uh, it, it's not especially designed well for building other things on top of it, where Ethereum is designed to build applications and even organizations on top of it, and it has its strengths and weaknesses. Um, so the one kind of uh, thing to keep in mind is, is they're not just one, and none of them are perfect. And so the, perhaps each of you might comment on uh, like four healthcare applications what are things that can be done with existing platforms like Ethereum uh, or, or something else, as you prefer, but what are like some safe, actual business uh, healthcare applications of using blockchain that can be done in the near term today? I'm stuck holding the microphone, so I'll start. Uh, one of the things that I did at PocketDoc, which if you're not familiar with PocketDoc, we <coughs> Our platform as a service, we provide developer tools for the business side of healthcare, for, so all of your medical and pharmaceutical uh, benefit, verification, uh, physician ID, patient ID, that kind of thing. We are uh, certified as a clearinghouse, which, and the reason we did that is so we could disintermediate ourselves once we move to a distributed architecture. Because one of the biggest things in healthcare today is a central clearing party. You may have heard of it. It was once called Amazon. It's now called Change. Over two trillion of the annual healthcare spend runs across their rails. They're also the largest customer of the U.S. postal system. Uh, I think if they went out of business, so would the U.S. postal system. That's all of those EOBs going out to the stamps. So what? What we found uh, is we built an alliance of both healthcare and other industry uh, enterprise companies to determine what they thought would be the best use cases for healthcare, not for us to determine it. And the first one that they identified that they could agree on to do together, because remember blockchain isn't about, if we aren't recreating centralized solutions, we have to create networks that agree to do transactions with each other. So what would they agree to do? And the only thing they agreed to do together, and that was banks, hospitals, insurance companies, life insurance companies, tech companies, was identity as a shared service. Because they all need it. Most, health, most hospital systems don't know who you are when you show up digitally, and they certainly can't resolve you across all of their backing systems which do not talk to each other today. So that was definitely one. I would, I'm going to hand it to Paul because I think there are others, but you know, I don't want to toggle the, toggle the so, so the, I mean, the other ones that were of interest were certainly uh, inventory. And so sometimes that's chain of custody of production to an end user. And sometimes that's just restocking the shelves. But regardless, the inventory was definitely of interest. And uh, you know, claims, adjudication, if you will, is something that makes sense to be on a distributed open ledger that many people can look at simultaneous. The other thing I'd say with respect to structure and health is I'm a big fan that private blockchains, not open source, are going to dominate uh, health in terms of what gets traction and what takes off. So although open source is certainly where blockchain started, in health, I have a hard time seeing a giant health system think that it's a good idea to send all of the data about all of their customers out into the world 
in open source, even if it's encrypted. So, piggyback off of um, Paul, uh, I do agree that the initial point of adoption is really going to be, well, permission chains, actually. Because it's not just even private, it could be public permission, like Quorum, for example, is offering uh, that kind of solution. Um, if, if people recall earlier days of dot or cloud, for example, um, we have a, a slower adoption curve. The, the vision is always public. The vision is huge. But in terms of what actually gets traction, is probably something that's not sized And so the bite-sized solution, I agree with Paul, be something a little bit more um, controllable, if you will. Uh, it's not completely open just yet. And it's going to be through trusted nodes and trusted players. Um, and I think added to, adding to what uh, Lisa was talking about, I think in addition to identity, is going to be access. So I think using particular cryptographic techniques, for example, to improve selective disclosure and access to that data and information and making the patient the arbiter of that information, I think that's really where you know, uh, the next wave is going to come from. And I don't, I don't know. I wanted to clarify one thing. It's really important. When you hear people say uh, adjudicating claims can be a smart contract on blockchain. Yes, technically it can be a smart contract on blockchain. Will a insurance company adjudicate that claim or pay it out any faster just because you put it on the blockchain? No. They have zero business motivation to pay it out faster. So be very careful about what you think blockchain will change about healthcare if anything, and become a student of its business models. Um, yeah, I think it, depending on what you're trying to solve, um, from an enterprise perspective, it makes total sense. I don't see them move to the public chain. Absolutely not. I don't see why they move to it. Um, so, yeah, totally makes sense. From a, from a consumer perspective or patient perspective, I think there's a lot of opportunities to work with um, open chains. There is, you know, what, what happened recently is that, number one, there is regulation, the GDRP, which is very clear about, uh, you know, privacy and consent and opt-in, so the entire healthcare industry is, you know, trying to redesign a few things about that. So, therefore, I think privacy by design is, is a very interesting tool. What happened with Facebook um, clearly um, raised some awareness around, you know, where the data is, do I own it, what's happening with my data. But I think um, from, uh, for me, for, from a, a research perspective and, and solving problems when it comes to models for, you know, to cure disease or have models to better predict what's next for a patient or for even an, an industry uh, for a healthcare company, um, you, you really need the consumer play and this is what we're hearing from the industry. Um, a lot of companies are really trying to move their, you know, their way around I mean, how do we get the consumer, that's the eternal question, how do we get them engaged, how do we, and so it feels like we have a few tools right now um, that we can leverage on that are very appealing from the patient uh, consumer perspective uh, when it comes to ownership, because again when it comes to your health, um, there's something that is, for me, that is, I, I don't understand how we still think that people can change their health if they don't own it. It's like for any sense, and so what I love about the blockchain, especially the, 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 the open chain, is it has the ethos of the open source and the features of the private market. And I think there's something to play with here that is very interesting. Thanks, Sam. So I'm going to agree, uh, and then you know maybe be a little controversial um, after that. So uh, in terms of agreement, um, definitely agree that um, the first three pillars um, and then permission chains, I think, will be the beginning part of the uh, of the adoption cycle, just because. Most of the owners of the data are not the individual. We don't own our data, right? Uh, our data is with clinics, it's with doctor's offices, it's with uh, hospitals, health systems. It's distributed, right? All of our data is distributed. I've talked to quite a few people who have said, hey, I took some time to get all my data and it took me many weeks and I had to fight for it and a lot of it was sent to me by fax and they wouldn't give me your, you know, any electronic version. So expecting people to give up all the data, you know, put it up in 
into a public chain where it would be, you know, uh, not necessarily looked at, but it would be traced and, and tracked, uh, is not going to make most of the healthcare players very comfortable. Putting it in a permission chain system where they get to, um, you know, basically control the process, retain control of the data that they have, maybe put a pointer into a blockchain system that points to what they have is something where you can ease in to uh, adoption, right? Make it a little bit faster. Um, but what I think, and I'm, you know, playing off of what Sam was talking about, identity. I think identity is going to be crucial. We really need to have our data. And if we start thinking about that, that really leads over into PHR, right? Uh, personal health record. And that's really a holy grail. And if you look at it, Apple is trying to do this. Uh, I think you know Amazon is probably going to, with their um, with the group that they are working with, is going to try to do this as well. Because, but that is doing it in such a way that we do not own, you know, our PHR. That's not really a PHR. That's a PHR on our phone. That's really centralized. So, I think in time when we get the most power from blockchain, the, the core application is going to be the PHR. I don't know how much, how long it's going to take, exactly how it's going to play out, but I would say PHR will be a foundation level, and then we can do a lot of that. I couldn't disagree more. So there, we're going to the I don't think people care about the data. I think Health Vault, if you remember that uh, disaster, pretty much help, uh, prove that people don't care about their data and they're certainly not going to proactively go out and try to uh, uh, bring it together for any particular reason. What they do absolutely care about is getting something they want, being, uh, being made well when they're sick, not dying, uh, getting services they need when they need them, being able to afford them, having the people involved in their care be able to communicate effectively so they're not misprescribed drugs. They care that the drugs that they take are safe. Uh, those are the sorts of things that people care about. They don't only really care, they don't care about the blockchain, they don't care about PHR, they, most of them don't even know they exist. Um, outside of the valley where we all talk about this stuff, people do not talk about these things. So think about, I would, I would um, and yes, no current participant in the U.S. healthcare system, Europe and other countries are, is a different story, but in the U.S. healthcare system, none of them are going to freely start to make their data available uh, without a motivation or an incentive and a way of getting compensated for sharing that data, whether you own it or not no matter what the state regulations are, are or how they may change. So think about how, instead of building the, the one P PHR to rule them all, what are the applications or the services or the activities or the networks that would cause the different actors to share information just enough to get something done that a person cares about or needs? Um, so just a quick note. Um, still so, 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 then, so if you look at blockchain, it's a very different model where we get paid for, we don't get claps, you know, when you have a social network that's on um, blockchain, uh, you don't get claps, you, or you know, you don't get uh, likes, uh, you get money, right? So it's about this third pillar, built-in gamification. So there is an incentive when we have our own data that we can actually monetize it. We can monetize our own data. And so if we're paid to have our own data, and if people pay us to access our data, that gives a built-in incentive for us to own it. And I agree, a lot of people don't know what it is, but if I can get one and then I can make money from it, all of a sudden it becomes very interesting. Well, so uh, Lisa started out with, with uh, identity and, and focused on other kinds of applications. And, and blockchain healthcare discussions quickly evolved into patient records and putting the, our patient record on the blockchain. And even that is kind of confusing in that the blockchain is a ledger that has a record of, of what things are put there, who has rights to them, 
and who's looking at things. But the data itself is not in the blockchain. It's not in the database. It's merely a, a like a spreadsheet list of pointers. And so if they take an X-ray of me, and I choose uh, to put my X-ray on the blockchain, uh, it, all it is on the blockchain is a pointer saying my x-ray is over there at that hospital and uh, I'm granting permission for somebody to look at it. And so it's, uh, they access the privilege and control to all of these health record data. Still, they can be encrypted and all these good things, but they still have the security risks whether or not they're on the blockchain. So if my x-ray was put on Equifax, uh, for example, uh, it might be still at risk, even though the pointer to it was on the blockchain. And so it's, um, the, but the health records are, is something that in the U.S. especially is under very strict law, quite different than social media or your banking records or your tax returns or whatnot, in that um, HIPAA is a very strong law that says, well, I can put my health records in the public, but nobody else who has them is allowed to do that legally. And, and there's significant penalties to do that. So it's really um, the, the individual patient who's opting in or volunteering in to put their records in the public like this. And so I wonder if uh, anybody wants to comment on this uh, security issue and, and this distribute where the data is and how does blockchain improve that? Can I comment? Yeah. So, Really quick, I, I agree it's going to be about access. Um, I think, in, and to disagree again with Lisa, I think anybody that's been to a doctor once, twice, 10 times, 20 times, or more, if you're a chronic, chronically ill person, or you have a complex disease or an issue, and you're visiting multiple providers, it can get very frustrating very fast not to have your entire record. So I think there are a lot of people that, I'm glad you agree, uh, I think there's going to be a lot of people that don't know about it and this is a question of with any new technology, with any new capability, you're going to have to educate technology companies, healthcare companies, providers, we're all going to have to get educated in this process. This is brand new things that are happening. It's not without challenges in terms of adoption, in terms of awareness. But I do think that people who have been down this sick path or have had a loved one go through this sick path and now you're advocating for that sick person in your life, you are going to become concerned about that record. You're going to be concerned about how many forms you fill out, how many times you have to fill it out, how many times you have to keep repeating yourself to every single provider that you happen to come into contact with. So I do think access is really going to be the central uh, issue here. And I do think that blockchain and cryptographic techniques like ZKP or Zero Knowledge Proof, for example, give the patient or give the person the ability to provide selective access, selective disclosure, without having to disclose identity, which is, to Paul's point, another point that's going to be very critical. So the mechanisms are there, how it gets implemented and how it gets brought out. I mean, those, those are nuances in terms of on the technical side, but the technology does exist that would be to be able to implement that, so. Well, and I think you didn't disagree with me. Uh, it's, uh, my disagreement with there needing to be one PHR rule them all, and and also we're starting to then aggregate data again. What we've done, we've just gone from decentralized to aggregating, so we've defeated purpose. But what we can do is manage access permissions on the chain for your data, which resides in many different places, so that no one individual, like my mother, who carried around a stack of paper for my type one diabetic father, has to ever do that again, either in physical paper or digitally. So the solution isn't to put the onus on the patient to manage that stack of data. The solution is to make it possible for whatever service they need to be fully informed by the relevant data necessary, and that it be accessible. So I totally agree with you on that. I want to, um, two other things that I was nudging Paul to say, but I, um, I'll see if he says it this time, is um, 
inventory said octopus is auditing anything that needs to be audited. Anything, think of an episode of care. How do you measure an episode of care when you have many different individuals? So this is Health Nexus. If you didn't understand, that's what they're talking about. In value-based care, you have to be able to audit and confirm that a number of different uh, providers and types of providers that provide a service for an individual around whether it's a cardiac surgery or a knee replacement. Blockchain is perfect for that. Uh, provenance for pharmaceuticals. The perfect early stage, first order use case to do on blockchain that uh, everybody can get behind who has to participate in that. And they don't have to give up large amounts of proprietary data to make it successful. So just a couple more examples of things that work well right off the bat that aren't too scary for legacy uh, healthcare providers. So I worked at a company called Practice Fusion in the electronic medical record space. Um, I was the first CMO there. I also worked at the first online bank, Nextcard, back in 1999. And at Nextcard, we would bring people in, and we would do focus groups. And we would say, what are your priorities? What's the important stuff about applying for, say, a credit card online, right? It had never been done, been done before. And everybody said privacy. I'm really worried about privacy. Really worried about my data. And we said, great. And we went through the rest of the focus group and talked to them about applying for credit cards. And at the end, on the way out, we said, hey, if you want to get on our mailing list and let us look up your credit, we'll give you a six pack of Coke. And they said, cool. <laughs> and, and to some degree, it's the same sad thing that we see with health, right? Everybody says owning their data, owning their record, access universally is important to them. And it is especially when they get sick. It really is. And I couldn't agree more with the idea of wanting everybody to have clean, easy access to their data. I would love that. I don't think anybody's going to actually do a lot of work until they get sick. And, and then it's a sad, difficult road. And I don't think that we can legislate it. We tried multiple times between blue, blue buttons and fires and, and, and anything else. It, we can't. Why, why can't we? Right? It's because of the wall of gardens. I don't think, unless you've worked pretty deep in this world of health tech, it's hard to appreciate the political strength of the wall of gardens. The wall of gardens are literally trillions of dollars in the U.S. being defended. That is your data. And they don't want to put it on the blockchain. They don't care what the permission is. They want to protect their trillions of dollars of collective revenue. And they're willing to buy your politicians and get them in office and set their political agendas and their voting agendas in order to make sure that they do that. And that's the challenge. There's no technical challenge at all to giving us the kind of PHR that we all really want. It's not a technical challenge at all. It's a political challenge. And it's about wall gardens and trillions of dollars of revenue in the US every year. So that comment about who owns the data, um, if you think about it in the context of a uh, credit report, that a credit report is data about me, it's data that I didn't opt into, it's data I didn't give permission for them to do anything with it, it belongs to them, it's data about me. And maybe the politics and the law will change to say that I have some right to see it, which that has happened, or, or change it, well that hasn't really happened, you can correct it. So it's not entirely that, that all data is ours. It's just specific to healthcare in the HIPAA law already that says healthcare data belongs to the patient. Yeah. No, I, I, would, I would love to see the law be able to do it. It's just, it's, it's difficult because you're fighting a lot of money getting the people that make the laws elected. So I think there's something interesting happening. Um, but what I've been trying, I think the medical record is very important, but it's not everything. And I think it's it's a little bit the mistake we are doing. I think that there is something very interesting in the multi-omics approach. And so the idea of aggregating you know, multi-omics data is very interesting, because a lot of that data is not in the medical record. And so if you take, um, um, and also what is in the medical record again, most of the time it's one point in time and so it does not allow to work with the data to build predictive insights for the people who need it. Um, 
When it comes to uh, the motivation to collect data, I totally agree. People don't care about AI, don't care about the blockchain. So if you want to do something for people, don't mention the technology, but build something that is super usable, super friendly. But there's also something very frustrating about medical information. So this has not been built for the patients. Our, I mean, our lab tests are very difficult to understand. It's like my telephone bill 20 years ago, right? I mean, I, I just don't understand what it means. And so if we can make that, you know, display it in a way that it's interactive, it explains to you what it is and so on. But I think what is also very interesting is in that multi omics approach, it has not been done before, connecting the dots between the omics. We have a huge shortage in uh, general practitioners in the US. This is very serious. But this is only one thing. What's happening right now is what, one of the omics that is core in uh, our health is uh, the genome. This is the core of everything, of all the omics. This is an industry that is exploding. The consumer-facing genetic testing is exploding. There are only 5,000 genetic counselors combined in the US and in Canada. It means there are only 5,000 human beings being able to explain to you what this test means. This is not scalable. And so we need somehow to be able to do a better job in explaining to people to have tools that, that um, you know, enable them to understand and be more engaged and, and you know, where there is some value for them to be engaged. And um, the, the last thing I wanted to mention is just to be clear, there is no data stored on the blockchain. It's impossible. There's not enough space. Right? Only coordinates uh, are being uh, in, uh, put in the blockchain. When it comes to incentive, so I find there is something truly unfair about the healthcare system. We are all generating health data. That data represents a trillion uh, million dollar market uh, in the US while people are still struggling uh, paying the medical bills. I totally agree with you, Lisa. So uh, when, when we're doing uh, building our product, we actually leave Silicon Valley. We do not ask people in Silicon Valley what they think about the way we're building because having a recurrent revenue of 200 or $500 in Silicon Valley means nothing. If we here, it means we can be here, we're working, we have you know, uh, uh, subsequent salaries. When you, you go further in the US, this is a very serious amount of money, $200, $500, is 5K per year. This is money you can use to pay your medical bill without compromising your privacy and the security of your data. And again, it's privacy and sharing by design via the smart contract. It's really sharing not everything, just piece of the data needed for that specific trial. And I just want to finish that um, there are in the US 30 million people with undiagnosed diseases. And we call them the invisible, simply because they are not classified. They hop from doctors to doctors, they are going crazy, and nobody can help them. And so those are the, that's the group we can identify. But at the end of the day, there are many more people who are just, they, they are not vocal. They are just frustrated, and there's nothing right now to help them to have better solutions. So I think um, the incentive between predictive models, helping with research, uh, but also being rewarded for that, uh, means something when you can't pay your medical bills. I just want to, I want to underscore something Paul said, uh, just to support that. The technologies to solve many of the problems that we're describing tonight on this panel have been around for a really long time. The blockchain is not first opportunity to try to solve the lack of interoperability, the lack of, uh, of being able to access your data when you need it. Those solutions have been available for years. The reason they haven't been put into place is that the current uh, data architecture, the EHRs, the practice management systems, the central clearing parties, are architected as walled gardens, as Paul just said and the business models depend on not sharing data. And it's not just them. The hospitals don't want them to share the data because that's considered patient leakage. But they will lose patients to other hospital systems. So again, the, before you wade in to this industry, super, it's not impossible, I'm not saying that, but I don't want to seem you know, jaded. Just be, uh, be educated. <laughs> 
and re-educated as to what the business incentives currently are, so that like what Sam's describing, build in incentives that will cause the networks to behave in different ways. Yes, interestingly, um, even though we started out and uh, started out with a controversial, uh, you know, discussion. Um, I do agree with much of what has been uh, talked about. Uh, Radhika and I wrote uh, two different papers. Uh, one, well, actually three. One on uh, blockchain healthcare, uh, uh, blockchain for healthcare. Another for um, you know the prediction of how uh, blockchain will get adopted. And a third on um, identity and trust and securing the blockchain. I think really what we're talking about is stages of adoption. As we all know, healthcare is not an early adopter of technology. And we wish it were, but it's not. It's not going to be the first, but it will get there. And so I think from a prediction standpoint, really uh, some of the cases that Paul was talking about in terms of what's safe. So if, you know, a pharmaceutical company can save money by you know, having provenance or supply chain or something like this, where, or there's fraud that's getting squeezed out of the system because you know every transaction is cryptographically signed and timestamped, and there's no um, no way for someone to say it did or it didn't happen. It's immutable. It's in the blockchain. So these types of easy um, you know uh, applications will be adopted because big players are going to save significant amounts of money. It was the same with dot-com. You know, if you, look, if you go back to dot-com, it was my first company with dot-com. And what happened is the large companies adopted, uh, you know, to save money. But there will be other sectors that will start bringing in identity and people will start being able to make money. And there is uh, a particular candidate in, in California named Ben Bartlett that believes, uh, he's running for um, state assembly, and he believes that the money that you can make from blockchain, to Sam's point, could actually be a mechanism for universal basic income, so UBI. So not that, it, you know, UBI is usually something that's thought that governments provide, but actually, if I can get paid for my data, and we know that people are making a lot of money from data, and everyone can actually share in this new money, uh, then there can be shifts. And it's not necessarily going to be in healthcare first. It's probably going to be in other areas, high tech, something, social media, et cetera. And then it will migrate. And people will say, well, I'm making money over here from my data. Why can't I make money over there? So in time, there will be more consumer applications. And as we've talked about, well, there are big scalability issues with blockchain anyway in the near term for consumer applications. So do the B2B first, get some wins. Other sectors are going to start adopting identity and people are going to start making money. And then it's probably going to migrate. So I don't know, 10 years, 15 years, somewhere <laughs> we may get PHR. At, at, at the risk that I sounded too pessimistic earlier, <laughs> I, I, I look at the business of healthcare like an onion. You know, it's got nine layers in there. And, and I agree, like, it's a bad idea to go in and say, I'm gonna extract the third layer from the outside, right? So to your point, there are things, and this, the, the three that I think we talked about collectively, ID, um, inventory, if you will, and, yeah. Um, <laughs> that are sort of the outside there, they can work today. And, and I think that's gonna be the way to attack it. We're just gonna have to go layer by layer, like, by layer, I think, like you were saying. Well, to shift gears a little bit, perhaps, one of the things that blockchain enables is, is distributed apps, and, and including distributed organizations. And so the uh, apps are basically code, and code is basically law, and law has a court system and judges, and and nuanced discrimination, but code doesn't. It just, if it breaks, it's a bug, it breaks. And so when you mix uh, distributed apps onto blockchain in healthcare, um, certainly getting paid sooner or later is, is one simple kind of application. But are there other things that, uh, is there a dark side to this, of things that could go wrong if, if AIs are, are running these distributed apps and, and the, like, immediate response uh, or instant karma of, of a distributed app 
Uh, do, do you see good things and bad things about these? Sure. Things can always go wrong. Uh, one of the things that we've been talking about lately are unless we have transparency into the design uh, of these different algorithms, uh, what data went into them, what the conclusions, because even if the conclusion was correct, it may not be a social value or contract, uh, at least in the beginning. That might be something we have to be trained into it. So yes, we can. This is a, a situation where we completely take our hands off the wheel and expect that we'll be running our health computation line. And at Pocket Doc, um, we never thought about releasing developer services as a way, for example, to replace doctors. Or a way to automate how you would move through the health system. It was a way to take the unnecessary pieces that are currently being done on paper. There's still 365 billion being spent on paper annually by the insurance companies. There's still 15 billion faxes being sent annually. And again, get familiar with this industry. This isn't an industry that's going to just jump into that problem is a bit out there. I just like to get them to stop faxing. Uh, you know, so, uh, but yes, we can't. Uh, this is, it's going to take a while. We and we have to participate, and we're going to screw up, and we're going to have. Uh, this is this is going to be a process. Uh, so I love Paul's analogy of the onion. Let's start with what they can, what the existing legacy players can get behind because it adds value and it takes fear away from them that they're going to lose their businesses. And let's just start there. But I love your question. It's, um, I'm not scared to wade into those waters, but I think we certainly have to participate. Uh, just very quickly, there are um, quite a few companies that do audit on smart contracts. And the good thing about code is you can actually do, um, and, and a lot of these are quite simple, is you can do mathematical uh, auditing of smart contracts. So um, I understand uh, that, you know, that this mathematical approach is um, bulletproof. Uh, we're always to find out when we start getting at scale. Um, if it isn't bulletproof and we have tremendous numbers of smart contracts that are operating in a trustless fashion and you know it's being operated by an AI which is also you know has some kind of a problem uh, and hasn't been audited correctly, well things will spin out of control. So yes, there is a dark side. Uh, the interesting thing about blockchain is that blockchain can also be completely centralized. Um, you know, we see this with the, um, the cryptocurrencies that are coming from governments, uh, Inverter Petro and others. These may sound like they're distributed or decentralized, but the most, um, the scariest vision is more of a centralized blockchain where everything we do, everything we know is recorded, it's immutable, and um, we don't have control over everything or anything and there's some other player, a government, or a company that has all knowledge about us. Um, sounds familiar to things that have been happening recently, but it could be everything, not just most things. Yeah, so I just want to say that the, the developer side of this is the concept of smart contracts, so they call smart contract, but there's no way I need them. It's, 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 you know, it's code executing itself. So I don't know who of you have heard of years ago of the DAO hack. Okay, so that was actually a very interesting question because so it's you know 50 million dollars disappeared. Oh you I would you must know, the, the DAO is a decentralized organization that was built by a uh, Vitalik from uh, uh, Ethereum on top of the Ethereum network and it was hacked uh, in a well, catastrophic so, there was, uh, was, was it hacked or was there a mistake in the code? Right. And so uh, that, that's an important one. So that's why the idea of auditing the smart contract is, is very important. And I think when it comes to healthcare, um, we don't join healthcare because it's easy and fun. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here. It's always very hard. And I think there's something very interesting um, about healthcare that is very problematic. At the same time, it keeps you, um, it's a sanity check. 
So again, I think it's really hard, whatever you do in healthcare, and again, I'm, I'm coming from a patient-consumer perspective, it's really hard to scale. You can't scale without strong partnerships with uh, some big players in the industry. And by having those partnerships, it's, a, it's, a, it's actually a good way to, to keep the sanity check in place, to have the proper Q&A, you know, to understand the limitation uh, of uh, what you are building and also the accuracy. When it comes to the AI, uh, which is more built to do prediction um, based on the data that is provided, so again, there are, so you can use AI to, to save costs uh, and you can use AI to augment. And I think we will never really replace a doctor by, by an AI, but I think it's very interesting to use AI to kind of replace the patient and build a new patient, a patient 2.0, a more educated patient, more emancipated. Um, and uh, for that part, the AI, we can already do a lot of stuff in computer vision and natural language processing, but we are very far away from the catastrophic scenario, honestly, we are. However, when it comes to the AI and the blockchain, I'm truly inviting all of you to be part of the design team, okay? Even if you're not programming, coding, it's still, you know, very vague. You know, there are so many opportunities in Silicon Valley, courses, workshops, meetups, uh, coding classes. I mean, if we are really building the 21st century right now, you know, all those tools we're mentioning, all those platforms, it doesn't matter if it's the current industry, the conventional industry, we are all building tools, and I think it's important that everybody gets involved so that we have a representation of what we want for the 21st century. Because even if we are dealing with an industry that is really slow to move, I think we are seeing things in the blockchain. So I've never seen that before. The speed of acceleration in what we are able to program and how programmers, coders are competing and the level of execution we are reaching today is just mind-blowing. It's really mind-blowing. So I, I really strongly encourage you to all participate in the design process of what we do. Um, so to shift gears again, um, there's one to two billion people in the world who have no identity on the internet, they have no passport, they have no license. Um, a good portion are, are refugees in one place or another. And because identity is something that the blockchain can do fairly well, does it make sense to put all these people, uh, give them an identity in the internet with the blockchain record? And, and there's good things about that in that they would have ability to buy property and get loans and other things that they can't do now. And, and some of the bad things, uh, like China's social credit score or uh, other uh, problems in healthcare, if somebody has a diagnosis of Alzheimer's or, or some kind of incurable disease, and that's put into the, their record uh, that then prevents people from getting jobs or, or a mortgage or, or lose their life insurance or their health insurance. So uh, how about this putting people's identity immutably into a public blockchain and, and the good and bad of that? I, I do think that there's some really great benefits of being more inclusive of diverse populations with using blockchain for identity. Again, I think I'm, I'm kind of come back to that whole access and selective disclosure uh, part of the equation because it's not like you're putting your entire record and making it public to everyone. That just doesn't make much sense. But it's about selective disclosure. So if you have somebody you want to provide a certain level of authorization or disclosure, you have the ability as a person, as an individual, to authorize that level of disclosure without necessarily revealing other aspects of your record. So I do think, coming back to the privacy issues, there are aspects about our personal identities, whether it's financial, whether it's legal, whether it's uh, you know health-related, uh, in, in any, any of these dimensions that we might want to have selective disclosure, being able to being able to authorize or provide that, and then certain parties where you know if it's financial, maybe you need to provide full authorization or disclosure to certain people that you authorize. I mean, when we go and say, okay, today's tax day, 
and we're going to share certain aspects of our financial records with our CPAs, our accountants, our tax lawyers, etc. I mean, these are people that we authorize access or give them proxy to be able to do certain things in our behalf for certain functions or tasks. I mean, this is exactly the way things are going to happen, even for healthcare. So, coming back to the identity for all, I think it's a huge opportunity. Um, when you're thinking about things like population health, for example, that's an area which has been sort of like a dream. I mean, it's true population health, I don't think is really at hand right now, because you're dealing with underserved populations or at-risk populations that are completely neglected, dismissed, ignored, unknown. I mean, these are hidden. Um, nobody knew about the opioid epidemic until it was an epidemic. Um, these are things that just weren't revealed or talked about or discussed or shared. So I think the, the ability to come back to that identity and be inclusive of people that we aren't including on the planet, if you will, I think there's a great hope or a vision that blockchain can provide that kind of scope. Yeah, that's the whole point of uh, decentralization. So the idea of, of having all your data in one place on your phone, on your own computer, and it's on your phone, it's encrypted. Do not share it, you know. It's, it's yours, so suddenly you decide where it's shared. When you want to share, that's what a smart contract does. So depending on uh, you know, the project or why you want to share that data, the smart contract will do the you know, data matching to just share that very specific piece of data. Uh, uh, and so decentralized storage, you take a company like uh, um, Falcon or Storage, that's exactly what they do. It's decentralized storage, so it means that from the moment that the data leaves your phone or your computer, it's hashed in hundreds of pieces, and then it's stored over thousands of servers. So it's, it's, it's practically a little bit, it's practically impossible to, to hack that data. There is that analogy in Stapspot, Don Stapspot, he was explaining the concept of decentralizing storage. It's like, you know, having a chicken being, you know, processed to, to make chicken nuggets. <laughs> You know, and it's it's like trying to reconstruct the chicken from those chicken nuggets. So that's that's I thought that was a very funny way of explaining. But that's what decentralization uh, does too. And so, what if the nugget is a piece of bad information, like Alzheimer's diagnosis? Like, it, it, what if one of the pieces of data that's put into the public ledger in an immutable, unhackable, unchangeable way is something that's bad? that uh, then changes your life. No, I, I, but again, it depends on, on, I'm sorry, you know, it depends on the purpose and what you're trying to do. So I, I can only speak for our platform, but what happens from the moment that you share the data, that data is um, de-identified and anonymized. And so again, it's not uh, the coordinates of that data are put on the blockchain and then the data scientists work with it. And once the models have been uh, uh, built and there's, there's a winning model, all that data is white. So it's not true. Just, just very quickly, I think we may have to wrap up. Are we here for almost out of time? We have any guess around energy. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, um, how many of you are familiar with Zcash? Zcash? Okay. So, Zcash, um, they have a protocol. Uh, called ZK Starks, which is uh, something that Radhika was talking about in terms of zero knowledge proof. And it basically enables you to um, prove something without sharing any knowledge. So I can prove on me without sharing uh, any, any information about myself. So it's a very interesting, uh, we write about it in, in uh, the, our last paper on, on identity, but there's a lot of information obviously in Zcash. Um, so this selective disclosure, it basically means that all of the information, and this is really initially Zcash is, uh, it, it takes your transactions and it basically obfuscates the uh, sender, the receiver, and what happened. But it does enable audit. So for example, um, if you want to um, prove your identity or if you want to prove that um, you have a particular disease, uh, you don't necessarily need to share the specific information, but somebody can uh, gain access to your file. And in that one small instance where you give, uh, you give access, they can figure out one thing about you. But then, if somebody is trying to look at your information online and um, you know, 
if there's this point about Alzheimer's, they will not be able to see that because it's completely obfuscated. Um, and it's again under control. So maybe uh, if does anybody have any questions to yeah. the panel? Right here, the first question. And then keep your hands up, I'll run around. So forgive me because I get really confused with the terms you guys are using and it's repeatedly confused me and I'm a very confused guy. So I have to ask a couple of clarifying questions to increase my confusion. <laughs> you use the term data as part of a distributed entity and then you use the term pointers and I come from the computer background. So if the pointer is looking at the data, and the data is sitting in the wall garden, and they are protecting it, how are they going to get around? You, you have to have permission to go through the wall. Who's got the permission? And the, the so protect it or the patient? Under HIPAA, with healthcare um, laws, it's easier to get permission to do that rather than going for your credit report or your Facebook data. So it's easier to for the So very practically speaking, uh, there are data transport uh, standards. You may even know that by asking that question. Uh, it's the the challenge, and this is really a challenge to all of you, is why would they? Mm -hmm. Right right now their business models do not incentivize them to share the data. They can share it. Uh, they can't they don't necessarily expose them publicly, but they have APIs that can be called to extract the data, different kinds of data. But they'll only do it now under certain circumstances, and some of them will only let you get the data out, but not put it back in. Or some of them will only let you put it in, but not get it out. So you, it's, it's what is the business model, what's the incentive for them to share? And what, what's the incentive to have a common API? Uh, amongst all these different wall gardens. Yeah, so they have the they have a common data transport set, a standard. Uh, the, uh, the newer version of it is called Fire. Uh, HL7 is it's really sort of a, a modernization of HL7. Uh, so that all exists. The, and that's kind of I keep emphasizing the technical. That's why Paul said it's not a technical problem. The technical uh, solutions for what we're talking about have existed for a really long time. You know, they may have been clunky, but they would have worked. It's the it's the business incentive for these entities who protect the data and therefore their patient populations that they don't want to lose to each other. How, how do we make that uh, a good business proposition for them? So there's something very interesting. So um, many providers have portals and so with API, so lab 